everybody. How's it going? Thanks for joining me this afternoon. I've got a great stream with a great guest that I think you're really going to enjoy. So I'm a big fan of history podcasts, listen to them all the time. And one of my favorites is, of course, the Martyr Maid podcast. And I have with me today the host of the Martyr Maid podcast, Daryl Cooper. Thanks for joining me, man. Great to be here. So, Daryl, you've got a, a couple of podcasts. You, you co-host with, with Jocko Willick, and then you've got your own podcast. It's very interesting that's, that uh, you kind of ended up in the space that you're in because I think a lot of people kind of became aware of what you were doing with Tucker Carlson, kind of walking through this large thread you did on kind of the Trump phenomenon and why people voted for him and why they felt betrayed. It's a very weird road to get to kind of where you're at now. I'm wondering, you know, can you give us a little background? How did you end up in this situation, do what you're doing now? And how do you feel about kind of having come into the limelight kind of through this process now? Yeah, that part, that last part is very strange. I'm an introvert very, very much by nature. And so I don't particularly like having attention on me. Um, even video podcasts make me a little bit nervous. But, um, you know, so I picked a weird career choice. But so I I was in the Navy for 10 years. I got out in 2011. Um, and I got recruited to work for the Department of Defense as a electrical engineer uh, working on air and ballistic missile defense systems out in uh, Central Coast, California. And so I did that for 10 years and it was a great job. I loved it. Uh, gave me a lot of independence. You know, I traveled all over the world. Um, it was a great job. And I did that for 10 years. A few years before I, I ended that in 2021, I started this podcast and and really I just did it because, uh, you know, I was spending a lot of time by myself overseas for work, had a lot of time to read. That's kind of always how I've passed the time since I was a little kid. You know, I, I moved around a lot as a kid, so I, I kept my nose in a book for some continuity. And, uh, you know, I would always be reading and talking to my friends about stuff that they probably didn't care that much about. And one day I was complaining that Dan Carlin, you know, only puts out episodes every six or eight months. And yeah. somebody said, well, why don't you make one? And so I so I made one and, um, you know, it became kind of a little cult classic or, or like a like a like a cult hit um, podcast where it had a small audience, which, you know, is to be expected for seven hour long history episodes. Um, but very, very enthusiastic and dedicated. They're really great, uh, small audience. And then I guess it was must have been two years ago now, almost exactly. Yeah, July 20, 2021. Um, I wrote that thread just on a lark. You know, it, it uh, <laughs> I had like 7000 Twitter followers at the time, and it was really just me talking to them, which is the way I always think of my podcast. Even now is it's just me talking to my own listeners. If other people want to come in and listen, that's great. What you know, glad to have them, of course. But you know, you, I, I don't try to please everybody. I try to just, I work for my own listeners. And so I was just talking to this small group of people after I had had a conversation with my friend's mother, who's an upstate New York sort of Fox News, normie, MAGA Republican, right? And uh, I had this conversation with her and I thought, you know, I think people just don't really understand this. And I think that I can under, I, that I can explain where they're coming from. And so I wrote that thread really, again, just to my own 7,000 followers. And, um, you know, it was crazy, like started blowing up and going viral. That afternoon, somebody, one of my friends calls me up and they're like, am I allowed to curse on here? I won't. <laughs> You're fine. Uh, you know, are you watching Tucker Carlson? I'm like, no, I, I don't have a TV to watch. They're like, what's Tucker Carlson right now? And so I turned it on and he's reading my whole thread that dedicates a whole segment to it. And of course, like, you know, everything kind of blew up from there. And then the next day, Donald Trump was given a speech at CPAC and he called me out by name, called me a brilliant podcaster. Brilliant <laughs> man. So it was uh, it was very surreal, you know, because um, I'm you know, I never intended on having a public profile at all. Um, and it's been something to adapt to for sure. Um, so that but that had happened. That's right. That had happened after I'd already moved down here and made the commitment to stop my work with the DOD. And I was very reluctant to do that. You know, I had 20 years toward a federal retirement. I was a GS 13. Um, I loved my job. Uh, but Jocko called me up one day after I, I put out one of my Jonestown episodes. I got to learn to stop spinning back and forth and fidgeting. 
Um, after I put out one of my Jonestown episodes, Jocko called me up and he said, hey, why don't you quit your job and just come down here and work with me full time? And I said, no, <laughs> because, you know, I, I like my job. When he called me, I was literally on a on a six month long assignment out in Kauai. And the government was putting me up in this beautiful resort because it was the only thing available. It was just a great job, you know. Yeah. And with all the travel and everything, I was making good money. And again, I was 20 years toward a retirement. And, you know, I grew up very poor. And and so being that close to a good federal retirement is like, you know, just making it into the middle class when I finally hit that threshold was this huge weight off my shoulders. And uh, so I told him no. But Jocko can, uh, believe it or not, be very convincing when he wants something. And uh, and so I'm in San Diego now. And um, and we do a podcast together called The Unraveling, which we haven't done in several months because our schedules have been ridiculous, but we're supposed to record this week. So, you know, in that podcast, uh, we deal with historical topics, um, but mostly, not all, but mostly more recent history. 20, we, we, we've been doing a lot on the Cold War, 20th century history but also contemporary politics. And then uh, the Martyr Made podcast, obviously, is where I go real deep on, on historical topics. Absolutely. And it's something that you, you don't sh uh, shy away from controversy. You don't sh shy away at some of the hard stuff. It's nice because it doesn't feel like you're chasing it. It doesn't feel like you're, you're doing it just to be you know, salacious or to, to, to get any kind of street cred for being edgy. You're doing it because it's essential to kind of the truth and what you're trying to convey which I really respect. And I think uh, you, you need a lot more of, especially in history. History uh, is a lot more controversial than people think it is when, once you start digging in, once you start telling the truth. And so uh, I, I encourage people to check that out. But one of the, that's one of the reasons I want to talk to you today is a lot of people kind of have a, a conception of the United States, especially a lot of conservatives, that I think is, uh, is a little uh, rosy, a little something that is not facing a lot of difficult parts of history. And I think that's not because they're not willing willing to look at those that, but because they've never often heard it from people who I think love the country and care about the country. The only people they've heard it from are people who hate the country, people who despise them, especially Red America. They can feel kind of that that animosity coming off of them. And so one of the reasons I wanted to talk about it with you is because I feel like you know with with your military background, with your experience, uh, you know, I, I think you read as somebody who people respect and people understand comes from a place of, of caring about the country and its people. And so when we delve into these topics, I think you're the kind of guy that, that unpacks in a way that, that other people who have that kind of background can relate to. Uh, so we're going to dive into that guys, but before we do, I do need to go ahead and hear from our sponsor today. So obviously you want to take control of the frame. You want to take control of the debate, but you also want to take control of your health which is why today I need to discuss a pressing issue with you, which is the FDA's attempt to control a powerful health supplement called NMN. This controversy surrounding NMN highlights how certain forces seek to manipulate the market and limit consumer access to beneficial products. And with the sell of NMN possibly coming to an abrupt halt at any time, it's crucial to act quickly. The reality is that centralized control over health products can lead to a lack of choice and innovation for consumers. The FDA's action to potentially reclassify NMN as a drug instead of a supplement only serves the interests of big pharmaceutical companies while leaving consumers out in the cold. The FDA is attempting to change the status of NMN supplements to be classified as a drug, which would allow pharmaceutical companies to control it. The move isn't based on the efficacy or safety of NMN, but is aimed at cornering the market and taking the supplement away from you, the consumer. And with the sale of NMN potentially stopping at any moment, now is the time to secure your supply. NMN, or nicotinamide mononucleotide, is a precursor to NAD+, which has been shown to provide numerous health benefits such as improving energy, weight management, endurance, strength, and even anti-aging. By potentially reclassifying NMN as a drug, the FDA is restricting access to a supplement that could significantly improve people's lives. Despite the controversy, you still have an opportunity to take advantage of Black Forest's NMN supplement. I just got this in, guys, and I'm looking forward to the boost in energy levels, mental clarity, and overall well-being. Everybody says once you start taking this supplement, you'll wonder how you ever manage without it. With the sale of NMN potentially coming to an end due to the FDA's actions, now is the time to act. 
Black Forest NMN is available for purchase, and you can even get a 10% discount using the code ORIN at blackforestsupplements.com slash ORIN. So stand up for your right to access beneficial health products and fight back against those who seek to limit your choices. Make sure to check out the link in the description below and use that promo code I just mentioned to get your discount. All right, guys, so let's go ahead and jump into it. Now, Daryl, I think one of the places that I usually start when I'm talking to conservatives about kind of what's going on is they, of course, care a lot about national security, right? They want to know that we have a strong military that keeps the United States safe, uh, that is out there making sure that their homeland is going to be protected, that their interests are being taken care of. And I think that's a good general conservative stance to take. I think that's a, that's a healthy thing, a respect for the military, respect for people who are protecting you, those kind of things. I think that is something that is really essential. But I think what can often confuse many uh, kind of American conservatives about our current situation, our foreign policy, is they don't see America as an empire. They see it as kind of this nation and it's got its own interests and it's all wrapped up around these 50 states right here. But when they don't think about it projecting power and the way that that kind of impacts other areas. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about kind of the idea of America as an empire, if you think it is an empire, and if it is, when did it become an empire as opposed to kind of kind of a more traditional or standard nation? Sure, it's an empire. Empires come in a lot of shapes and sizes, right? The Athenians always insisted that the Delian League was not an empire. Of course, it was an empire, and we recognize that now. And historians in the future will look at America and recognize that we crossed that threshold sometime in the early to mid 20th century. I guess you could debate, you know, uh, when we embarked on the Spanish American War, that was an imperial move to a degree, but we did kind of retreat into isolationism after that, even after World War I. But after World War II, uh, I, I think it's, you know, it, it's, it's undeniable that, that America is an empire. I mean, we received tribute in the form of having the world's reserve currency, um, you know, which that's exactly what it is. It's a form of tribute, a very advanced form of tribute, allows us to do things we would otherwise never be able to do uh, without it. Um, and we involve ourselves in in, in the affairs of uh, every country on the planet, you know, we, we, we consider it our business, um, how the Arab states in the Middle East relate to one another and not just, you know, this is our ally, Sa Saudi Arabia. And so you better not threaten our ally. You're going to deal with us. That's understandable. But to actually manage their affairs and you know, foreign and foreign affairs and their domestic affairs. Um, and you see it in Ukraine, you know, you would think just standing back from a historical perspective, if you were to say, should America or Russia have more influence and in, say in like what's going on in Ukraine and what military alliances? And clearly, you know, it, it's Russia. Russia has far more interests there. They have tons of history there. That, that doesn't necessarily mean that you you throw Ukraine to the dogs and, and let Russia dominate them. You know, Russia's a part of Europe. And so they're they're a part of the of the civilizational structure that we're a part of. And so we can we can have dialogue there. But it's an imperial impulse to think that we should have more control over what's going on in Eastern Europe, especially Ukraine, than Russia does. And Americans, you know, we've always, and, and this goes all the way to the top, I think. I really do believe this, like, you know, that, that the people at the top, there's obviously some cynical actors up there. But I've talked to a lot of people who, who have spoken to or know very well people who were very high up in the Bush administration, the second Bush administration. And when they said that we were going to convert the Middle East to a bunch of, you know, democratic republics and they were going to welcome us in the streets and we were going to, they believed it. They really did believe that. And it's crazy to think about the, the, the fact that the people making decisions on our behalf around the world are operating with delusion at, at that scale, but but they really did. A lot of them did believe it, and you know, uh, Americans, you know, we 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 were, we were born out of a revolution, right? And we like to think that we threw off the yoke of tyranny. Of course, the American Revolution has, you know, there's a revisionist version of that too, but that we threw off the yoke of tyranny, and it's our role to kind of go around and. If there are, are, are other people out there who need help, just as the French helped us, then we should we should help them. And that's how Americans have always seen our foreign interventions. It's how they're always framed. It's how they're sold. And it's how most people genuinely feel about them, at least, you know, on the right. And 
I think you could, I think that that case is becoming increasingly difficult to make. I'll just put it that way. Uh, you know, it, it, especially, I mean, gosh, when you get into, I think for a lot of, a lot of conservatives and, and, and I can tell you some very, very, very well-known people that I know, uh, conservative, um, public, public persons, um, who have told me personally to my face that they flew an American flag in front of their house their entire lives. And they took it down during the Syrian war because they just couldn't bear what we were doing over there. And, and, you know, I understand where they're coming from. Like it's in my blood. Like I was a veteran. I worked for the DOD. I had uncles and grandparents who were in the military going all the way back. It's in my blood to just be a flag waving normie kind of, you know, American nationalist conservative. Um, and especially, you know, somebody who's interested in history, like, you know, I think about things like, you know, assuming that we don't, we, we don't blow up the world somehow, or, or, you know, as long as humanity is still around and living in a civilized way a thousand years from now, just as we like look back and read about the Roman empire and think about the glory of this, of, of this amazing society, historians a thousand years from now, 2000 years from now are going to read about the United States, the country that went to the moon, you know, that all of these things. And that matters to me, you know, I mean, I, that's, that fills me with pride. It really does. It really does. And when we do things like, uh, like we've, like we've been doing around the world over, over, especially the last 20, 25 years, but obviously it goes back farther than that. Um, you know, it's indefensible and it really makes me sad. And it, 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 I would say it makes me sad. It makes me very angry for that very reason is that I care about how we're going to be looked at 500 and a thousand years from now. And I think that's really important because, like I said, I I think a lot of people are starting to suspect, and many people on the right are now starting to suspect that kind of this uh, blind embrace of the State Department and its agenda has been a big mistake for the right. A lot of people who are at their core, like you said, they're conservative, they care about their country, they care about its legacy, they they want uh, they they want it to be something that is positive. They have an innate uh, love for for kind of the military and those protecting them. They wanted to just kind of automatically say this is this is good because it's something that is that is being carried out. But they, I think, more and more people are starting to understand that this has been done in their name, but it, <clears throat> it is not something that is great. And that's why you're seeing a lot of the neocons flee, of course, the Republican Party and and go to the Democrats because really their only issue is the war machine and that they don't really care about they never really cared about conserving america it was just the yeah the convenient place to push their agenda at the time but yeah which is too bad by the way that this second generation of neocons has been such a disappointment to their fathers because their fathers there were some genuine intellects who they they did care about america it was in their own way sure they were a bunch of former trotskyists and everything and they had a perspective but they were patriots and uh you know it's really sad when you look at when you look at how, I mean, but that's how it happens. I guess that's how dynasties fall. So, well, and, and you mentioned, uh, you know, kind of Syria there. I, I think most conservatives have like no idea what you're talking about there. Could, I know, I know that we, you could spend and, and you know, many podcasts going through everything there, but could you just give a, a little bit of a survey level of kind of what happened that people probably don't understand? I mean, Arab Spring, right? Bad, bad guy over there, Al Assad, like we were, we were helping people get rid of him. That, that's good, right? What's, what's the problem? What happened over there? Um, well, put it like, you know, you, you could just start with how it turned out. You know, we destroyed that country and contributed to the destruction of that country. But the way to the way to think about what happened in Syria is, uh, you know, if you go back to, we have this tendency in America where we learn lessons from a war that goes really well for us. And then Several years later, we think, well, that's a great idea. We can try that again. We did that in Iraq. We, you know, the Gulf War was such a roaring success. The technology of our military, everything. We can do whatever we want. Like, what evidence was there that the U.S. military could not go around the world and do absolutely anything it wanted? That was all the evidence. And so we embarked on the second Iraq War, you know, with, with that mindset. Well, back during the 1980s, when the Soviets invaded Afghanistan and the CIA ran the project there to start funding and arming, training Mujahideen from around the world to flow into that country and fight off the Soviets. From their perspective, it was a roaring success, right? 
The Soviets got their asses kicked and they retreated ignominiously. And we didn't have to pay very much for it. I mean, a few Stinger missiles and, you know, some training camps. And we really didn't have to do that much until you get to September 11, 2001. But even still, with that blowback, it was looked at as a massive success. Well, that network, you got to think, you got to ask yourself, like, if we're looking for tens of thousands of Arab fighters to, to you know, make their way into a war zone, find their way to the right people from like some slum in Cairo, right? They got to, this is somebody who has no money. He has, he's probably illiterate, you know, very often. This guy has to manage to get from his slum in Cairo to the mountains of Afghanistan, find the right people, get trained, be integrated into a paramilitary unit, and then go out and fight the right enemy. I mean, there's a whole operation behind this, obviously, right? There's, you have the Saudis, and now the Qataris are obviously very involved, where they have madrasas all around the world, not just in the Arab world, but in, in, in the West and other places too. And they use those to figure out who would be solid recruits for something like this. They radicalize people. They select the ones who, who want to do it. And uh, they feed them into this machine. And we make sure they get where they need to go and uh, get armed and get trained and, and, and get pointed at the right enemy. Well, so in Afghanistan, you know, you can make the case that, look, the Soviets were invading Afghanistan. We helped Afghanistan drive out the invader. And whether or not, you know, we should have anything to do with Afghanistan, period, like it was the context of the Cold War. I'll cut them some slack on that. But what Syria was, was they turned that whole operation around. They said, well, if we can use this global network of madrasas and everything that we've used to recruit and funnel these fighters into Afghanistan to defend the country, well, why can't we do that in Syria to overthrow this government, to win a war, you know, aggressively, that we're actually trying to accomplish something aggressively to, toward a country? And the answer is, you know, theoretically, there's no reason you can't do that. And that's exactly what we did, you know? And, and it's, it's a, uh, <laughs> I mean, look, for most of the time that we were funneling weapons and supplies into that country, everybody knew that the only serious anti-Assad fighting force in Syria was the Al-Qaeda affiliate in the country. You know, you had the Kurds up in, the, you know, the, the Syrian defense forces up in the Northeast that the DOD was working with, who, by the way, got into firefights several times with the CIA's jihadist proxies. But they were not interested in leaving their homeland to go fight Assad and take over Damascus. They were fighting ISIS for us. They were defending like this area where the oil fields were that, that were strategically important to us. But they weren't marching on Damascus. That was never going to happen. The people who were doing that, the anti-Assad force, were straight up jihadists. OK, you can listen to interviews with like Jack Murphy, former special forces guy, army special forces He's got a podcast called, uh, I think, Team House. Really good. And uh, he's got a lot of connections all over the military, you know, back in the special forces community. And Army Special Forces was doing most of the training in Jordan of the people we were funneling into Syria. And he said, he said this, he didn't imply this or anything. He said it straight up, that guys he knew who were over there working those, those training camps, special forces guys he knew who were over there in Jordan were telling him, that the, our army guys there were on the verge of mutiny because they were like, you are sending us straight up jihadists. This is, you know, we went into Syria. This is 10 years after 9-11 and you're having us train and fund and arm an Al-Qaeda affiliate. That's what you want us to do, you know, and they were outraged. I mean, and so it got to the point where they were on the verge of just refusing to do it. But what they ended up doing was just, you know, handing them a gun and being like, yeah, you point it that way. Now go get blown up by a Russian jet, you asshole. You know, like, but that's how bad it was. I mean, that's because you got to think, who are these people? Like who, who around the world is going to be some dude who lives, again, in a Cairo slum or up in Chechnya or something, and they want to leave home to go into Syria to overthrow the Assad government? Of course they're jihadists. Like who, who else do you think would do something like that, you know? And so we knew that the entire time. We knew who these people were. We had, I mean, there's a guy that John McCain is in multiple pictures shaking hands with. He was a leader of one of our main proxy militias over there. And right before the Russians and the, and the Iranians came in, 
and turn things around. When the jihadists were on the outskirts of, of Damascus, it, you know, and it looked like Damascus was going to fall. He's out there cutting videos saying that Allah is going to punish us for not having killed all the Alawites sooner. And we're this is who we're sending weapons to, you know. And so, and, and again, it's 10 years after 9-11 we started doing that. You know, if you would have told us on September 12th, 2001, that in 10 years you're going to be sending weapons and training for combat an Al-Qaeda affiliate in not Afghanistan, where bin Laden was, not even in Iraq, in Syria, which, you know, didn't have anything to do with anything. People would have thought you were crazy. But of, of course, that's what happened. And so, I mean, one of, one of the best ways I've, I've had it to sort of put to me, and, and this really does apply very well, is you have to think of like, or actually, let me preface this with like, uh, I, there, there are there are people who either their families or themselves now were in Aleppo, were in some of these places. You know, there's some Druze people and, and, and Arabs who were in these places or had families there. And they said, you know, they tell stories about the entire city. It's not occupied by an army. OK, it's occupied by dozens of completely unregulated militias made up of psychopaths from all over the Muslim world you know, people who were crazy enough to want to get a gun and go into Syria and fight for ISIS or Al Qaeda or whatever, all hopped up on, you know, captagon methamphetamines, running around the city, raping their daughters, just running. They would literally have, you know, uh, different blocks that would have graffiti tagged on them to be like, this is the Chechen's block. This is the, you know, such and such block. And imagine you, there were families in these cities. Okay. Imagine living in that city with your daughter and your wife there, you know, and, and having and having to go through that, like sending these types of just completely unregulated, no military discipline, no structure, no, no accountability, no nothing. Taking these people from all over the world, sending them to attack a country, as far as I'm concerned, should be it, it should be as much of an international prohibition as like using chemical weapons on civilians because it is that filthy. You know, it is absolutely. And we see what happened, you know. And so so the, one of the best ways that anybody has put it to me is said, you have to think of like in America, if Russia or China had started arming and funding tens of thousands of like a hodgepodge of neo-Nazis and KKK and, you know, whoever, all the scary groups like in the United States. And they start arming and funding them and they say, go overthrow Washington, D.C. We want you to march on Washington. And they say, OK, boss. And they go and they stop at every town along the way and kill all the blacks and Jews, you know, because that's what happened in Syria is, is our own militias were going they're supposed to be going over to Damascus. They're going to kill the Yazidis. They're going to kill the Druze. They're bragging on tape about genociding the Christians and Alawites when they take, you know, Damascus. And we're and, and that did not, it didn't stop until Donald Trump took power. And, and to his credit, okay, like I have plenty of criticisms of Donald Trump. But that first summer, you know, I think it was, I think it was as early as early July of 2017 when he was in power, he ended that program. And when you saw what happened, as soon as we cut them off, they all collapsed. You know, every single one of those militias, ISIS collapsed, they all collapsed. And, you know, because even these moderate, you know, so-called moderate rebels in that country, you know, these were, this is another thing, like you'll hear from people who were directly over there involved with this stuff, that these, you know, the, the, the people running the Al-Qaeda affiliates and everything, they're not stupid. You know, the, the Americans show up with billions of dollars in crates of weapons and they walk up and say, hey, I'm from Al Qaeda. Can I have some of that? They're going to tell you no, of course. And so you set up a front group. And that's what all these moderate rebels were. You know, you think you have moderate people in Syria who are just, you know, they live off in eastern Syria and they're just so hopped up with rage at Assad that they're going to leave their family in the midst of this war zone and go and try to you know, destroy Damascus. Come on. It's just completely ridiculous. And that's what we did to this country. And it's horrible. You know, uh, every single Christian in that country that wasn't killed by one of our proxies was being protected by Assad, was being protected by Russia, by Iran. That's just the facts, you know, and I don't like, I don't like saying any of this stuff. You know, I don't like it, especially because I, I you know, I have so many friends. I, I know people who were killed in Iraq and Afghanistan. 
Um, I, you know, I, I have friends that served over there. Of course, Jocko served over there. He lost men in combat fighting these wars, you know, friends of his, people that depended on him as their leader who were killed, you know, in Ramadi. And, you know, it's such a cliche to say that, you know, you, you, you still support the troops, but you don't support the war. But there is a, you know, the, the only way I've been able to, to sort of make that, to square that circle in my mind, because I really do believe that it's, that it's true. I think that the, I think that the troops were over there fighting a noble war in Iraq, for example, because the people they were fighting, you know, the idea that these were like just moderate nationalists who didn't like an invader in their country is complete nonsense. These were head chopping jihadists from all over the world, pouring into Iraq to rape and destroy the Iraqi people uh, while they were fighting the Americans. And, and that's a fact. And that's who our, our guys were over there fighting and killing is a bunch of animals. Um, but those animals are rampaging through that country because of the decisions our country made, you know, to go in there in the first place. And so um, it, it's, it's, it's enraging and it's disheartening. You know, and I was going to say again to um, to Donald Trump's credit, like people, people, it shouldn't be such a, you know, such a big accomplishment to have not started any new wars in four years. Right. I mean, like if you would have gone through most of American history, they'd have been like, OK, and like, but it's a huge accomplishment these days just to not start new wars. And, you know, I think about like, you know, right before I stopped working for the DOD. I would go out to military installations to work with their guys on their air and ballistic missile defense systems. And it was such a weird experience because like once we got up to 2019, 2020, 2021, I would go out there and there would be kids in the Navy who were 17, 18 years old. And I realized like, wow, this kid can vote now. And he was not alive when 9-11 happened. That's crazy, right? And it's a sign I'm getting old. But like, you know, this kid grew up his entire life we've been at war. His entire life, and it's just one after another, after another. His entire life, you know, our politics has been completely consumed with you're a Nazi. No, you're a communist. You want to destroy the country. No, you, that's all they know. That's all they know. And it's, and it's, I mean, it's no wonder that this young generation is so radicalized in both directions, you know? It, it's, it is amazing. I think, for a lot of people to realize that that they've been at war the entire lives of these kids because like i used to teach high school so like i ran into this all the time right they have no no living memory of this no recollection of kind of what the context is this they don't know what it's like to not be in this scenario but they don't feel it right there, there's no like yeah. we're at war that doesn't mean anything to them is is that do you think kind of this general disconnect is is that like people just don't realize like we conquered the world after world war ii and and have kind of lived in the in this idea that we we can continue to project this forever without any cost. I mean, do they think that's just the the kind of kind of the state of uh, the way the world will always be? They, they that's why they think there's always like a Thomas Jefferson and a George Washington hiding somewhere out in Syria to to kind of transition everybody to kind of the, this enlightened uh, liberal democracy. What is it that that disconnects even the most patriotic Americans? From kind of what is being done in their name? What 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 is the constant state now of kind of this empire? Well, I think one of the things is uh, that military service has very much it's you know we almost have a military caste in this country, where people who join the military they had dads and uncles in the military, they had grandparents in the military, and if you are one of those people or you know one of those people, you probably know fifty people who are veterans. If you go to another place, you know, another place, even maybe in the same town, they don't know any veterans, you know, because it's just not part of their social circle. And so, you know, we, we don't fight mass conscription wars anymore. We fight boutique wars that are fought with high technology and special forces and, and things like that. Even, you know, in Iraq, I think at the, at the height, we had like 160,000 people when you, when you counted private contractors. And so, um, you know, it doesn't affect them directly in that sense, where anybody they know is going to be getting sent over there. Uh, and if they do, you know, look, everybody's talking now that, you know, they're, they're having a ton of fun pointing out how Russia's having a tough time with the Ukrainians. It's such a ridiculous way to look at things. You know, the Russians are fighting a war that 
nobody has ever fought before. You know, modern weaponry, modern, all the modern tools, satellite imagery, all of these things, and you don't have total air superiority. I mean, we've never fought like that. You know, if you think about like, you go out, when we, when we, even even in Vietnam, I mean, this is a, the, the insane way we, we fought that war of just using our soldiers as bait. We would send them out to walk on patrol, get shot at, and then call in airstrikes. And that's what how we basically fought the war. And it's like, imagine if you couldn't call in the airstrikes. <laughs> that's what Russia's dealing with right now. And it's very hard. I mean, the Ukrainians are very tough. They're very motivated. They're very well equipped. And, uh, and the Russians don't have, you know, total air superiority. It's very hard. But every war that we've been associated with since the Second World War, or since Korea, rather, well, we had air superiority there, but at least we suffered some casualties in that war. Every, every war since then, though, has been one where, you know, we, we had, to say we had an advantage is kind of obscene. You know, when, when, you're, when you're bombing people, with drones driven, you know, driven, fl flown by somebody in Nevada, and you're bombing somebody who literally has no air defense. I mean, that's, I don't know, it's something unseemly about it to me. Um, maybe I just, you know, I need to get with the times, I guess, swordsmen don't like archers, whatever. But there's something to me that's a little unseemly about that. But you can also learn really, really bad lessons from it. You know, like, if you, if you knew somebody who went over to Iraq, and look, Iraq was, a horrific war for America in a million different ways. You know, what it did to our self-image, what it did to our politics, and of course, what it did to our people. I mean, we had, I think we lost like 5,000 soldiers or so dead, but there were tens of thousands who were wounded. But even still, when you count all the people that rotated through there, the casualty rate was extraordinarily low. You know, same, same in Afghanistan. And so um, it, it allows us to think about the fact that like we fought and lost two wars that over the course of 20 years, I mean, one took almost 10 years, another took 20. We, you know, we got chased out of both of those countries, basically, literally in, in, in Afghanistan. And your average American, if they didn't have, you know, if they weren't checking their phone or watching the news, they might not even know that there was a war, you know, so to be able to lose two wars and have your average citizen on Main Street, not even not be affected in the slightest way. I mean, at all, you know, it does give them a lot of leeway to, uh, to, to do what they want in our name without us really speaking up much about it, you know? And I yeah, think I we're running up against it now in, in, in Ukraine, because now there's a real country involved. You know, this is a real country with a real military that if we ever decide we want to fight them, we're bringing back the draft. We're going to lose ships sunk. We're going to lose aircraft. We're going to, I mean, even if we win, like all of those things are going to happen. And so that's where we're at now. And, 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 you know, you hope that that pattern of learning terrible lessons from earlier, you know, successes, quote unquote, uh, doesn't drive us into a conflict with Russia or China, because that would just be a nightmare. Yeah. And I guess that kind of puts us where, where we're at now, because like you said, there's not really there wasn't as, as as horrible as the consequences were for the people living there. There was no real consequence for Americans trying to dabble in Syria or Libya and just kind of destroying these nations without, without even really thinking about it. But the amazing thing for me is watching America kind of come out of, you know, especially the American elites, uh, you know, what was a probably devastating amount of kind of pushback when it came to kind of their desire to force kind of COVID lockdowns, kind of the, 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 the global uh, credibility of kind of the, the the world order was stressed to kind of its maximum. And despite that, they immediately jumped into this war, right? Which if you, if there was any self control inside of a ruling class, they would let things cool down for a little bit, right? They, they right, would, they would right. kind of reestablish this. They'd let pressure release valve, but they, they immediately jumped right into this feeling like there's just no reason not to immediately put themselves at the other end of a, you know, a, a world power that could nuke them, you know, in, in theory. Uh, and, and just that lack of hesitation kind of blows me away. Is part of that again, like the, the America America's loss or, or I, when I say America, I do mean, you know, basically NATO and the, the wider empires loss of the idea that there are any other legitimate geopolitical concerns for other nations like just just no other nation 
has a sphere of control because the, the like the world order has been established and this is the only thing that can ever kind of dictate who or what could control any given area of a, a everything else is a li- illegitimate uh, invitation to just you know invade all of Europe because you didn't want NATO sitting right outside your border. Yeah, I mean you hit the nail on the head. You know, obviously that's what's going on. I mean, you know, Russia's a a millennia old millennium old country, one that we've been allied with in multiple wars you know, major wars in our history, a Christian society, an advanced European society. And when they raise concerns over having an anti-Russian military alliance 400 miles from Moscow, that's how far, you know, the eastern border of Ukraine is from Moscow, um, to have an anti-Russian military alliance parked on some on, on planes on, to their west that they had been invaded to apocalyptic effect twice within living memory, you know, not too long ago anyway, World War One, And to, you know, and, and to have had ex- experiences like the Cuban Missile Crisis and everything that we did with Cuba when, when you know, before Kennedy made his commitment not to overthrow it. The, with the Monroe Doctrine, every piece is there that you should be able to understand why this is concerning for Russia. And I think they do understand perfectly well why it's concerning for Russia. Um, And yet they treat Russia's claims as if like as if they have no more legitimacy than like Al Qaeda's claims. I mean, that's really how they treat Russia is their concerns. It would be like Al Qaeda saying we don't like this. You you have no legitimate interests. You have no legitimate concerns, period. End of story. We're totally implacable. And I think that, you know, unfortunately, Unfortunately for the Ukrainians and for the future of Ukraine, um, I think the Russians have gotten that message. I think they've gotten the message that the United States cannot be negotiated with. We cannot, we are incapable of making reliable agreements that are going to last longer than one presidential administration. I mean, we have lied to them over and over. You think about how, you know, think about like the, the 1991 commitment that James Baker, the Secretary of State, made to the Russians. That NATO would not, that if they allowed Germany, you know, again, country that had invaded them twice to apocalyptic effect that they were quite, quite worried about. Everybody was worried about like, should Margaret Thatcher thought we we shouldn't allow Germany to reunify. Like people were still concerned about what if this comes back up, the Russians most of all. But we said, if look, if you just let the wall fall, let us unite uh, these, you know, East and West Germany. Germany's going to be integrated into NATO. And the way they sold that is because you don't want an independent German military power on the continent, like feeling like it's threatened from the East and the West. It's better if they're under our umbrella and we can like exercise influence there. If you allow that to happen, then we will, I mean, the quote, and we have the documentation now, is we will not move NATO one inch east of the, of the East German border. And so the Russians hear that and they say, okay. A few years later, we decide, of course, we're going to continue moving uh, NATO east. And we start doing that. And all of a sudden, these people, these Americans who are involved with these discussions come out and say, well, yeah, I mean, we didn't sign a treaty saying that, or we didn't quite technically, and if you read like the exact way we phrased it, like we left some room for, and like, you can do that in a courtroom or something. But the Russians are over here like, what are you talking about? Like we were in the room with you when you made that agreement. You looked us in the eye and, and, and this is this is a vital national security issue for us. And you just looked us in the eye and lied to us. And that has just happened again and again and again. And you have senior, I mean, the most senior American diplomats, Bill Clinton's uh, secretary of defense back in the, in the mid 1990s, who was against the first round of NATO expansion and was trying to fight against it, thought about resigning uh, in protest when they decided to go forward with it. And he gave an interview and he said that in all his discussions with everybody in the national security establishment, everybody in the Clinton administration, when he would try to bring up Russia's concerns about NATO moving to the East, that, what, what did he say? He said that the response universally was Russia is a third rate power. It doesn't matter what they think. OK, and like that's how we've always that's how we've treated them. And, and you know, guess what? I mean, Russia, they don't have the ability to project power 10,000 miles away the way we do. 
you know, that's true. They don't have quite the uh, ability just economically to sustain a massive military effort halfway around the world for a decade at a time or, or whatever. But on their own border, they are extremely formidable, you know, and it turns out that at the end of the day, you can you can make all these statements you want. You can lie all you want. But in geopolitics, there is a bottom line and that bottom line is force. And that's where we're at now. And I think that Russia, unfortunately, probably has is of the mindset now that they just have to finish this, that there's no alternative to it, because, you know, uh, even if we say, OK, we'll keep Ukraine, um, you know, let's say Donald Trump wins in 2024 and he ends the war and says, you know, we're not or he, or he calls for an end to the war and says we won't bring them into NATO. They're going to look at him and be like, you couldn't even control your own deep state for four years. Like you got completely subverted by them. And then as soon as you were out of office, they reversed every policy that you made. Like how we just have to finish this war. There's no other way to, to deal with this. And we put them in that in that situation because of our own cynicism and our own, you know, just willingness to just dishonorably lie through our teeth, you know, to 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 major nations that we should be dealing with on an adult level, you know, and we just have not done that. And it's infuriating and it's incredibly dangerous. I mean, because, I mean, people today, like it was not that long ago that nuclear war was considered a very, uh, uh, like something that could definitely happen. You know, it was not that long, it was just a few decades ago. And I don't think, honestly, like I think today, it would take a lot. It would really take a lot um, for a general nuclear war to occur. I mean, it's it's really it is kind of inconceivable. Like I think even if Russia, you know, was on the verge of losing Crimea and they used a couple tactical nukes on Ukrainian military forces, like in the field, that maybe we, you know, so then we use a tactical nuke and take out the Sevastopol naval port. I, I still think that probably at some point, uh, once a balance was found where both sides felt like they'd hit back more or less equally and, 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 uh, you know, could, could end it with some amount of honor and face being saved that somebody would enter, that things would intervene. Sanity would prevail before it became a strategic general nuclear war. But you don't, you don't know that, you know, all it takes is one person to say, well, we don't know if the American, how the Americans are going to respond to us nuking, you know, this Ukrainian military base. And if they decide they're going to really like escalate, we, you know, we should do a, I mean, there's a million things that could happen. And um, I try not, I, I honestly just try not to think about the nuclear side of it. It's one of those things like, you know, it's, it's, it's like worrying about a plane crashing when you're already 30,000 feet in the air, it's like if it crashes, that's it, you're done. So forget about it. But there, you know, but there are, there are dangers like far short of, of uh, nuclear conflict that could really touch us. I mean, if these idiots up in, 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 if these idiots in Washington get it in their head that we can go to war with Russia or China, I mean, it's, it's going to be an extremely rude awakening for this country. It really will. And, um, and that's very scary just because like, you know, if we go over to decide we're going to fight China over Taiwan or something, right. And China who has a formidable Navy now and a very, very formidable, uh, anti-ship missile capability. Um, if they sink one of our aircraft carriers, say, you know, 6,500 Americans go into the water, a couple, you know, the, the, the destroyers and cruisers and frigates that are escorting them, they get sunk. So you got a few thousand, you know, maybe 10,000 Americans killed, an aircraft carrier sunk. I don't know how we'd react to that. We might nuke China. I mean, these people in charge now, they they might nuke China. And I mean, that's actually, it's actually interesting. Uh, ad, an admiral, a retired admiral, uh, gosh, which one was it? Recently retired admiral. He, uh, he wrote a book called uh, 2034 with another, with another guy who's a novelist. And it's, it's it's a story of a war between the U.S. and China and how it how it happened, how it built up and then how, you know, what ended up happening. And there were no armies or anything like that. Nobody got anywhere near each other. It was all fought with nuclear weapons and with, you know, and, and so that's exactly what happens in his book is we say, well, 
we'll show them and we send a carrier strike group over there because they can go wherever they want. They're the most powerful. You know, one of our carrier strike groups is is more powerful than any Navy on the planet, pretty much, ex with the maybe exception of China and Russia. And so we send them over there and they sink it. And we don't know what to do. We can't send another one over there. And so we nuke a couple of their cities and then they nuke us back. And that's what happens. And so people at the very highest levels are thinking like this, you know, and they're aware of it. And you just hope it doesn't get that far, you know, <laughs> and uh, there's a million reasons to think that, you know, to, to hope for that just because, you know, for one, it would be just an awful tragedy. Uh, but, but also, you know, we're, we have this issue right now. This is something that like, I was at a conference last year and they had me on a panel kind of talking about uh, national security stuff because of my uh, DOD experience. And, you know, they were all very much geared toward, you know, what should we do if, if China does this? Are we ready for this war? Are we ready for, you know, this, this attack or whatever? And the only thing I could keep, and I just said this over and over because it was the only thing that I could really think to say is, you know, like as long as these people are in charge of our country, you know, so that us taking over your country means, you know, you're, you're you know, you're, you're, you're going to have uh, pride marches, you know, twice a year and you're going to have to have, you know, whatever. Twice all these, a year, wouldn't all that be great? Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. All, yeah, right. Yeah. But like as long as we're going around the world, it's just the fountain of of degeneracy, just pouring it out on every country where we have influence and every country where that resists it, we declare basically an enemy and, and, and go after them. Like with, with all of our focus, as long as we're doing that, I don't, I don't care if we can beat China in a war. Like, I don't, I don't want these people to win that war. Why would I want that? Why would I want the people, these people to win their war in Syria? Of course, I was rooting for Russia and Iran and Assad in Syria. You know, and they're all problematic regimes, obviously, but they weren't trying to commit genocide against the you know the, the Sunnis who were in that country. There were more Sunnis hiding behind Assad's lines from the jihadist militias than there were in the rest of the country. Most people don't know that. They know the Shiites and the Druze and everything else were hiding behind Assad's lines. There were more Sunnis hiding behind his lines than were off, you know, on the other side. And so, if, you know, why should I root for our side, quote unquote? when uh, you know we're we're in a war like that and the answer is i just don't anymore and and it sucks because it goes against every instinct i have but you know i sometimes you just have to be honest with yourself about things even when it's tough you know do you think these people understand i mean i'm sure they understand on some level but do you think they're really grappling with kind of the readiness issue because obviously uh you know boys from appalachia are not signing up to, yeah. to get pride marches into Saudi Arabia or, you know, or, or you know, Iran, whatever, like th this is, they're, they're running into a real problem. Like you said, there, there's a military class in this country and the military relies on these high skill operators coming from basically dynasties that are supplying like, you know, rough and ready guys to get this stuff done. And they push, you know, they, you have the, after uh, January 6th and, you know, with the COVID purges and then the attempt to to kind of purge again the military with, you know, the different background checks and uh, are you an NRA member? Have you ever voted for Donald Trump? You're you're shoving all of the competent guys out of there yeah. and you're instilling this, uh, you know, the basically this Lenin-esque, uh, you know, loyalty pledge over any kind of competence. How are you going to, and then you're running your empire at full steam ahead into the most ridiculous opponents you've ever had. Something's got to break here, right? Surely someone around there is, is, is doing the math. Yeah. People in the military like to say, and it's, there's a lot of truth to this, honestly, that if you didn't have Florida, Texas, or Appalachia, we would not have an infantry. And, uh, you know, recruiting obviously has collapsed, especially in those core areas, the combat areas and, and people from those regions. Um, but I'll tell you, like their behavior on that front is one of the things I take a certain amount of encouragement from because I tell myself and I could be wrong. These people could just be completely insane that this is not the way that a regime that thinks they're about to be in a major war behaves. And so for all their rhetoric or anything like that, if they really thought we were going to be in a big war with Russia or China, um, you know, you don't as much as you might hate them and want them out of the military, whatever. You don't alienate that group of people as much as you have. You don't purge the ranks the way they've done. 
And so it tells, because I mean, look, like, I don't, I don't know what AOC or Nancy Pelosi believe. Like, they could just be completely insane, and I wouldn't be surprised at all. But I, you know, the, the the people up in the military, it's it's there's a there's a misconception I think among a lot of dissidents and people who are critical of our foreign policy about the competence of the military. I can tell you from extensive experience, again, not just with the units that I was in, but in my DoD job, traveling all over the world, working with dozens of different uh, of units in organizations that, you know, you got some very competent people in there. I mean, you, you know, you have, when you get your NCO class, I mean, it is top notch. Like we have an incredible NCO class. Our officers, yeah, there are people in there who are clowns and they go do their tour after they get out of ROTC and then they get out of the Navy or whatever. But when you get to like the 05 level, you know, when you start talking about commanders, majors, these people are almost uniformly impressive people. You know, they're intelligent. They're they're people you would want running your business, right? Something like that. And again, it's a, there's going to be exceptions, but that's generally true. And when you get up to the higher levels, to the flag levels, you know, there's a filter now that didn't exist in the past where, um, you know, if you go back to like World War II, there were World War II generals whose names we know, like, like famous generals who who went on to have you know, military equipment named after them, who literally got fired for performance in the field in World War II. And then after a year or two of working under somebody else, got another command and went on to be a legend. That would never, ever, ever in a million years happen now. You get up to the point where you're being evaluated for general or admiral. If there is anything in your record whatsoever that is even remotely controversial, remotely, that you're just not going to make it. You're done at 06, period. Like you're just not going to make it to the flag level. And so it fosters this extreme risk aversion, this extreme political correctness among the officer corps. And the ones that actually make it up to that level, you know, it's a, it's a cliche to say it. admirals and generals are politicians, but they absolutely are. You have to be. It's the only way you get to that point in the modern military. And um, and yet these people, they still understand their job. You know, they understand uh, the risks that are out there. I mean, when it's something that's very interesting that's actually happened over the last, I would say, especially the last 10, 15 years is, and this is so strange to say, you know, when we think about like Cold War era, Dr. Strangelove type stuff, but almost uniformly, the DOD has been the restraining factor in our foreign policy. You know, they've been the ones, when we, when it came to Libya, all the pushback that existed in the federal government over our uh, intervention in Libya was coming from the DOD. Same thing, you know, when, when, I mean, these people are the ones who actually go out and do the fighting. It's their people who get killed. And it's, when it all goes to shit, they're the ones who get blamed for it, right? So, and and they've they've just had experience after experience over the last twenty years of being thrown into an absolutely no win situation in Iraq or something, being asked to do things that they were never designed or trained to do, and then when it all goes to hell, getting you know the DoD gets blamed for it, and they're aware of that, and you know it's why the CIA was like literally running operations, information operations against DOD personnel, like DOD executives who were working in Syria because those DOD executives were refusing to send the SDF to support the CIA militias in the West. And so they were literally running info ops in the media against these guys. And so that, you know, th there are factions in the U.S. government. That's something very important for people to understand is that there are factions and they don't all, you know, again, we had, D <laughs> you know, the SDF was in combat with CIA sponsored militias in, in Syria at times. And so, so those do exist. And I mean, I think maybe that's our, our one hope, you know, is that there are people who are the ones who, who are affected when the rubber meets the road, who understand that the people making decisions for them and for us um, are not the people with the skin in the game. And, um, you know, you don't, I don't hope for a military coup or anything, especially with this military leadership, but you know, that, that, that might be, it might be, I mean, it's not looking good when you look at people like Millie and everything, but, but it might be a source, maybe the best hope for a source of resistance to the regime. 
when you look at kind of the response that has now happened, we, we look at our military and, and kind of what's going on, but we've had these you know, progressives for a long time. We've had liberals for a long time. They've been very anti-war. They've been very vocal about their all of their attacks on the military industrial complex and the American foreign policy. And, and this has been a core part of the left for decades and decades and decades. It's, it's been one of the most serious things for the, for the people who are the farthest left. And we saw how quickly that all turned on a dime, how, how a slight amount of, you know, conservatives, you know, people in you know, a few people in the GOP saying, maybe we shouldn't blindly follow this. Maybe there's some questions to ask. Maybe maybe we should start you know getting some accountability here. How immediately they all just became the cartoon of what they accuse the McCarthyites of being right. Everybody is a Russian traitor. Everyone is an agent of Putin. Everyone you know the, how quickly they accelerated directly into everyone needs to be locked up, censored. Uh, you know it, it's it, everything is treason. When you see how radically that shift can occur in just the the space of a few years, what does that tell you of of kind of where the left is at and, and yeah, the, here's, they're, here's they're, the, best, the best way to, to put this. I, I, I don't think if you gave me 10 years, I could think of a better way to put it than the way Dave Raboy put it on Twitter. He said that the left does not have foreign enemies. They have foreigners who remind them of their domestic enemies. And that's the answer. That is the answer without which is, which, it, which puts a really nasty, you know, spin on the whole Russia gate thing. You know, this made up story about Trump and Russia collusion, because I don't think, you know, look, the only reason these people, the Democrats, I'm talking about voters, hate Putin so much. And the reason they're buying into all this propaganda is because they see Putin and they think Trump. And it doesn't matter at this point that it was all made up. You know, the emotional attachment has already been made. And so, you know, it doesn't really matter. But. You know, that, I, I think that is a great insight. I mean, because it, it really is true. Because, I mean, think about it. Like, the left was the one, you know, they, they were always calling for detente with the Soviet Union. Like, you know, ease up on uh, the Soviet Union, trying to avoid conflict. They're even being critical of, like, the moves we were making in the, in the Cold War when they weren't directly taking, you know, the communist part in, in the conflicts. And then Russia throws communism, throws communism to the side. And becomes a country now that, you know, the Russian federal government has built hundreds, I think thousands now, actually, in the last 20 years, has spent government money building churches all over the country. You know, this is the, 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 the Russian Orthodox Church has a place like at the table in Putin's cabinet now. And, um, you know, and this is something that they're taking very seriously. And all of a sudden, you know, the left hates them and they're the, the prime enemy. And I don't think that's a coincidence. I think it makes perfect sense when you really think about it like that, you know, the way the way Raboy put it. Yeah, absolutely. One more question before we we kind of look at maybe some of the, the questions of the audience there. You talked about kind of the uh, the madrasas everywhere and, you know, the how it's now become global influences is kind of a necessary part of almost everything. I mean, that's always been the case to some extent, right? There's always been. Uh, nations influencing each other and sending people who have a certain level of influence into other nations and kind of messing with what they're doing. That That's nothing new. But with the amount of interconnectedness that we're now facing, are, are we kind of transition from a time of, of nation states or even empires to something that's more akin to like a war of meme plexes where any, any and every military uh, or geopolitical kind of a situation is going to be preceded by kind of this, this large propaganda push that's going to, kind of flex combatants into one area or another? Yes. I mean, I don't know if, I don't know if, um, you know, I've thought about this a lot. I've asked myself that same question a lot. And um, it's easy to see how it could go in that direction, how nations could just, you know, they, 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 they just can't hold up under, under the pressures of, you know, the, the interconnected technology and, and communication systems that are out there. Uh, but then, you know, you see a country like Russia and you can, you know, you can you can pump all the propaganda about Ukraine that you want. At the end of the day, they have to walk across minefields dodging Russian artillery to achieve their goals. You know, I mean, one of the things that one of the things you remember when Afghanistan was uh, collapsing, when we were being chased out of that country and uh, somebody leaked somebody in the in, in the government leaked 
the contents of Joe Biden's phone call in the weeks preceding that with uh, the Afghan president, Ghani. And it was very striking because the contents of it were, Ghani is telling Biden, look, we've got tens of thousands of Taliban fighters supplemented by Pakistani intelligence and special forces marching right now. We don't have the capability to deal with this. We need help. We need air support. We need this. We need that. And all Biden said, he said it like five times. He said, look, the perception out there is that things are going wrong. We need to change that perception, okay? You know, you need to maybe fire this general and put somebody like who's seen as a warrior in there because that'll change perception around the world. We need to change the perception of what's going on. The Taliban don't care about your perception. They do not care. The Taliban represent ground reality, you know? This is a goat herder with an AK-47 who's marching on your city. He does not care about your propaganda. And... I, but I, but it was very revealing, right? Because like, if you, I don't know if you remember the uh, the the president of of Afghanistan when it fell apart uh, wrote a book called How to Fix Failed States, and it's an incredible book because you go through and he's talking about you know he's talking about countries in Africa and you know Somalia and so forth and what could be done to to help these places and other other failed states in the future. This was like I think 2010 or 11 he published it. And as I'm reading it, you know, I, while Afghanistan's falling apart, I got curious. I'm like, how was this book reviewed in like foreign policy magazine, foreign affairs magazine, et cetera? So I went back and looked, glowing reviews, right? And I went and found uh, the one, there was one negative review and it was in Publishers Weekly. And they were quoting certain parts of the book and they were talking about how, you know, he's, the, the examples he's drawing on are like, Singapore, you know, all these, he's using all these like modern sort of techie catchphrases about like synergistic interrelation between blah, blah, and all these just absurd things, just completely absurd when you're talking about a country like Afghanistan. And obviously it was proven to be absurd. But I guarantee you, when that guy walked into the office of some guy at the State Department or whatever, Oh, their pants just fell off to their ankles. You know, they they love this guy. He was saying all the right words, saying all the things, because, you know, to them, that <laughs> that's reality to them. These people live in a world of symbols, you know, in a, in a world of words where, where that's what matters to them. And that's what they think matters in the world. Um, and, you know, they go out and they execute policy based on that assumption. And when they run into real world, actual resistance, you know, you see what happens. I mean, they, they basically freak out and panic and just completely lose their minds when they meet any resistance around the world. And, uh, but yeah, I think that's what's going on. I think, I think that, you know, these people, they, they think in terms of perception, they think in terms of symbols and words and the idea that there's a, a reality beneath that, that they're going to have to contend with at a certain point has just, that's not been their experience for, you know, most, most of their lives. I mean, you think about like today, Think about the whole foreign policy establishment. All your GS-15s, all your SES, you know, executive service guys who are running the State Department, the DOD and all these things. You know, the Cold War ended, what, uh, 32 years ago now. And so all those people, their entire careers have been like all of their professional experience has been when America can just do whatever it wants. And there's no consequences. We can lose two wars and it's like, ah, eh, that's embarrassing, but whatever. Right. And that's their whole, that's, that's their whole experience. And it's not a, you know, it's, it's not a mistake that uh, all of the guys who were very much against NATO expansion and cautioning, you know, uh, counseling caution toward in our relations toward Russia after communism went down, these were all old cold warrior guys, you know, George Kennan and stuff who would actually come up in a world where no, you, you can't just do whatever you want. There are other powers out there who can and will resist you. And you have to learn to live in that world. The people in charge now have never lived in that world. You know, they've only just recently been confronted with it, with Russia, and they're going insane and pushing us to the brink of nuclear war. Absolutely. All right, guys. Well, we've got a lot of super chats stacking up. I don't know that we're going to get to all of these, but we'll do our best to answer a few here. I don't want to keep Daryl forever. He's already given me a good bit of his time. But before we switch over to the questions of the people, Daryl, where can everyone find your excellent work? Oh, um, so I have a sub stack where I put all my podcasts and I 
write essays and occasionally do interviews. Uh, if I was as good as you at doing them, I would do them all the time, but they make me nervous and I'm not great at them. So, um, but I, I, I write essays and there's audio versions and all my podcasts go there and there's podcasts there that are for subscribers only. It's martyrmade.substack.com. Um, you can uh, look it up. Obviously, like the podcast is available. All the history podcasts are free. Um, they're available on iTunes or Spotify or whatever you use. Just look up Martyr Made um, and you can look up Jocko Unraveling. If you search for that, it'll come up. There's a couple unravelings. We actually got an angry email from an old lady who uh, has a podcast about knitting. <laughs> <called Unraveling. laughs> You're going to get a cease and desist here. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and so Jocko Unraveling. And I think we've got about 35 episodes of that up now. And, and, and those are there. And it's very interesting because Jocko has a great uh, perspective on a lot of these things. You know, it's a guy who has commanded men in these wars we talk about a lot. So, um, yeah, that, that's where you can find me. Excellent. All right. Let's go over to our questions here real quick. Uh, Matty Ice for $10. What would Daryl think of the right uh, really pushing that the left learned about the Franklin scandal from the 80s on the back of the Epstein uh, interest? I feel like. That could be very effective. Thanks. I don't know if you're familiar. Or the, the... I am. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, the, the Franklin scandal is not the one I would focus on. Uh, just for, for one reason is that it's very easy for that story to become very complicated. A million different moving parts that, uh, you know, a normie that you're trying to explain this stuff to could very easily get lost in. Um, I don't know exactly like... Um, what to think about some of the stuff in the scandal. I mean, there's something, there's something going on there for sure. Uh, but I think it's a tougher one to explain than the Epstein stuff, for example. I mean, Epstein, that should be a bludgeon that we just beat the regime over the head with from now until they breathe their last freaking breath. You know, I mean, there it is all laid out and everybody knows it. How crazy is it that, what do the polls say? Something like 70% of Americans they don't think either Epstein killed himself or they, they think he killed himself or that he was assisted in, in being killed in, fe, in, in a in a prison in Manhattan. Right. Like the high. I mean, 70 percent of Americans believe that and they're probably right. And that's a great starting point if you're trying to, like, drive a wedge to open up people's minds about the nature of this regime. I mean, this is somebody who, uh, you know, he was a serial mass pedophile and child rapist who had relationships with all of the people now making decisions in our lives, like, you know, telling us what to do, what we, what we can do and not do well during COVID and, and everything else. And he's got deep intelligence connections that cannot be refuted. You know, um, that, you know, that, that personally, I think Epstein is the one that, that, that I would beat him over the head with once people learn about Epstein and they start, a, they start going down that rabbit hole then Franklin for sure is, you know, it's going to be their next, their next stop. And you've laid those details out both in podcasts and in, in an article for, I think I am 1776, right? Yeah, I did a, uh, I did an article for I am 1776. That was a sort of, I guess it was sort of a summary of the third episode that I did out of the three Epstein episodes, which was talking more about, you know, the, uh, a question that really, this is a question that nagged at me for a long time until I sat down and did the podcast and really kind of answered it to my satisfaction, which is, you know, look, I get that these people at the top are grifters, that they're amoral and, and, and so on and so forth. But how is it possible that this guy Epstein could move around in these powerful circles for years and years and years in a place like DC? Like if you, if you go to DC, I mean, you know, this is a town where they will find any tiny little thing twisted out of context if they have to, to destroy you. If, right. you know, you're on the other side of a mundane issue that's being debated like this week or something, right? Cutthroat town. And you have the highest level politicians, Bill Clinton, people like that, flying on a plane that everybody else calls the Lolita Express. And Epstein didn't call it that. Other people gave it that name. So they, people knew what was going on, right? And so you ask yourself, like, if I'm Alan Dershowitz or Bill Gates or Bill Clinton, 
like any person I know, every single person that I know in my personal life, right? If they were to walk onto somebody's private plane and find a half a dozen underage girls who are not related to the guy you're there to meet at all, and he starts asking you if you want a massage from him, I mean, they're either going to kill that guy or they're going to flee screaming off of that plane. Every single person I know, probably every single person you know, that's how they react. And yet none of these people react that way. And you say, well, what, why, why is that? Like, is it just, you know, the, the money or what? And I don't think it's that. I think it's that when you actually go through everything and you see the way these people live, when you look at like the, you know, and I cover this extensively in the podcast and anybody who is like sort of up on Pizzagate and everything is probably already familiar with this part of it. But you look at the, uh, the art collection of somebody like Tony Podesta, where he is, you know, He's got pictures in his house that are being featured in, in magazine photographs that are, that are profiling his art collection in his home. And they are pictures of dead kids on his wall, like just plain as day. Uh, and you say, well, OK, this is the most powerful Democrat lobbyist in Washington. How is nobody? This is the brother of Hillary Clinton's campaign manager. How is no Republican hammering away on this every single day? Why does no Democrat talk about Denny Haster? They still talk about Nixon. You think that they would just be bludgeoning the Republicans with Denny Haster. Nobody mentions that. And I think that, you know, you have a, a, and this is not unique to America. This is something that happened in Europe a long time before it happened here, happened with the British gentry, happened with the French in the pre-revolutionary period, where the elites become so decadent and so amoral. And they reach this place where I think they, you know, you know, you're, you're the king of the world. You're, you're the, you know, you have, you're a billionaire or you're the president of the United States. You can declare wars. You can do anything you want. And you want to test your freedom. Like how much free, what can I actually do and get away with? You know, can I do the worst thing possible? You know, according to a normal person, I think if you were to ask a, a normal person uh, what the worst thing possible is, um, you know, it would be pedophilia. And, um, you know, uh, Elites become decadent and, and they become arrogant with their decadence over time when they get away with it for a long time. And that's the great thing about the Epstein story is they were so arrogant with everything, you know, and, and, and that a lot of this stuff happened, especially the intelligence connections and things that everything that substantiates all that happened back in the 80s and 90s before anybody realized that there was going to be this thing called the Internet where every document, every piece of information ever was you know, going to be in the wild and, and, and it was going to be much harder to control narratives on things and control information that, you know, because of that, people were sloppy back in the day. I mean, when you go back and look at whether it's the JFK assassination or a lot of the, the CIA ops back in the day, these things are not covered up very well. And it's because he didn't really have to because Walter Cronkite wasn't going to talk about it. But there's a lot out there. And um, I'll let you move on because, yeah, you probably <laughs> yeah. want to get to more <laughs> This is what happens. I talk when I get nervous and I just keep talking. So. Well, like I said, the good news is you've got uh, many episodes on that. So anybody who wants to get deep into it absolutely can. Uh, Death here for five dollars. What do you think? Who do you think is driving uh, policy at this point? The U.S., the EU, a, a collaboration of oligarchs or the oligarchs attempting to uh, attempting to power grabs? Uh, so let's focus that question a little bit, I guess. Do you think that um, that formal governments are still the ones driving the majority of these decisions or are overarching, uh, you know, financial or uh, international policy concerns, the ones that are more kind of leading the approach of kind of the global American empire? Hmm. You know, that's a that's an interesting question, because the part of the government that does actually control everything, right? It's it's not one of the three branches you learned about in Schoolhouse Rock. It's the federal bureaucracy. You know, 99% of what gets done by the government is done by the bureaucracy. And they operate independently of elections, you know, even though they're supposed to work for the executive. And, uh, you know, those people, they go in and out of government all the time. And so to say, like, whether government is, you know, government's certainly implementing the policy, how it's being driven and whose interests it's geared toward. I mean, there's a certain element of it where we'll put it this way. There's no, in my opinion, there's no cabal of elites that are in a smoke filled room, sort of coordinating all the different things that we're concerned with. 
you have interest groups who are very, very focused on this issue. And because they are, and because they have a lot of money to push that, um, and a lot of, you know, they can hire people to dedicate all their time to pushing it, um, that they get, you know, they tend to motivated minorities, right? Motivated and concentrated minorities get their way on the issues that they care about because they care a lot more and in a lot more organized and focused way than the majority doesn't care. It's why no subsidy ever goes away in the government, right? right? Because you give somebody a subsidy and all the people who receive that have a massive interest in making sure it stays. And your average American voter is kind of like, yeah, I don't like it, I guess, but whatever, you know, I'm not going to change my vote over it. And so that's, you know, it, it, it's a, it's really a combination of public and private interest in that sense. I mean, I think like uh, um, when you talk about something like Ukraine, you you really see the the sort of you, you see how these things mix and meld together in Ukraine, right? Because obviously there's a lot of private interests over there, um, going right up to the president and his son, as we're finding out now. I mean, the level of corruption that the Bidens were engaged in Ukraine, not the level of it, the brazenness of it is just insane. But um, so obviously those private interests, you know, I'm sure there's, I'm sure Halliburton is looking forward to rebuilding Ukraine with right. American tax dollars or, or seized Russian assets or something. So that, that certainly exists. And yet when you go into uh, the state department, you have these career employees, they're not taking orders from some oligarch or doing something because they think it's going to help Halliburton get rich. They do it because they're a part of this institution, and that is the culture of the institution. The culture of the institution is we hate Russia and we want to we want to hurt them any way we can, and they yeah, believe I, that, and that's the way they look at it. Yeah, I think this is a really important thing, and I've argued this with many people, but I'll continue to stand by this, guys. Political formulas are a confluence of true belief and interest. It's not yeah. one, and it's not the other. And when you, uh, whenever you try to separate them, you're always going to fail an analysis. You, you have to look at these things as as kind of Co uh, one coherent thing. In one of uh, George Kennan's essays, early essays about the Soviet Union, um, I don't think it was in the long telegram, but in, in one of his early essays, he says exactly that is people want to know, like, did these communists over here, do they really believe this? Or is it just, you know, they're in charge and they don't want to give that up. So it's self-interest or whatever. And he said, that, you know, these things get mixed together and not just, you know, a person who's a true believer and a person who's cynical about it, and they're happy, they happen to be working, you know, for the same purpose, these things exist within the same person, right? You know, um, I, I remember even something on a smaller scale, like when I was, uh, it was a question that kept coming up when I was uh, studying the Jonestown cult, is it this Jim Jones guy, did he actually believe in all this stuff that he's saying? Or is he, you know, he just gets to have sex with all the women and do whatever he wants. And that's awesome. And so he's going to do that. Um, and the answer was both. I mean, it was really both, you yep. know, and, and that's the case in government, too, especially when you talk about these career employees in places like the State Department. Yep. I think that's absolutely the case. All right. Uh, Justin here for five dollars. We'd love your work, Oren and Daryl. Uh, can either of you recommend a book on the difference between mm. being right wing versus being conservative? Uh, I'll say that I'll just get mine in real quick. Um, I, I can't think of a book that uh, specifically outlines the differences here. But if you want to understand this, read people who are a little outside of the liberal tradition, especially uh, older books. If you want to get an interesting comparison, look at the difference between Joseph de Maistre, Thomas Carlyle, and Edmund Burke all talking about the French Revolution. That's a seminal event that kind of splits, uh, I think, a lot of kind of the way people think about politics and turns it into kind of the modern way that we think about politics. And each one of them, I think, brings a very interesting um, a, a way to look at that. So uh, that's not a direct answer, but I'd say that, that that's a good place to start if you kind of want to grasp the difference between kind of where th where right wing or conservative thought branched out uh, kind of in one place. Yeah, I think that's about as good of an answer as I could come up with. I can't think of any individual books that cover the topic, but that's a good answer. I've got a uh, back here somewhere. I've got correspondence between uh, Alexis de Tocqueville and Gobineau, all their letters back and forth, things like that are really great, you know, to read the, the, the people from back then. Absolutely. Uh, Creeper Weirdo here for $2. You guys think uh, the people want the U.S. to be an empire? Uh, Creeper Weirdo is always doing ironic tweets. So that, yeah, I appreciate that, man. Thank you. Um, I mean, look, um, people are always going to be invested in the glory and power of their country, right? So like people, like, look, you can embark on the most immoral 
insane, aggressive war imaginable. And if you win, your people are going to be happy about it. And they're going, you know, it's going to be remembered well by them as a great moment in your history. And that's sad, but that's the truth, right? And if you have the most just war in the world that you can absolutely justify why you're intervening in some place, but it doesn't go well, it's going to be remembered poorly. Um, so that that certainly exists. Um, but I think overall, like if, if the question is put to them in the proper way, the answer is obviously no, you know, because what people would rather have is a nation. And you can have an empire or you can have a nation, but you can't have both. Because when you have an empire, the whole world has a stake in the decisions that are made by your government, by your country, yep. right? Like legitimate stake, really, yep. you know, in, in how your country's run and the decision it makes. And so, you know, we talk about foreign influence in our government or whatever. It's like, well, yeah, what do you expect? I mean, we're we're rampaging around the world, overthrowing governments and, you know, picking winners and losers. Of course, they have to do that. It's a matter of survival for a lot of these countries. And what that means is this is not really just your country anymore. It's the whole world's country. And that's what happens. And if you put it the question to them properly, people do not want that. People, you know, they want a, they want a nation. They want a government that is dedicated to them and their descendants and making sure that they're going to be OK, whatever else happens in the rest of the world. That's what people want. Absolutely. Uh, Watt here for five dollars. Philip Drew, administrator by uh, administrator by Colonial House, is an interesting historical curiosity showing the mindset of malignant American foreign policy. Uh, I'm not super familiar, but I don't know. If oh, you love it. You love yeah. it. It was written by Colonel House. Yeah, I got it up here okay. somewhere. Uh, Colonel House, Woodrow Wilson's like main go to hatchet man kind of uh, fixer guy. And he wrote this book. Um, it's called Philip Drew Administrator. And it's basically, I think he wrote it maybe like, I'm pretty sure it was after the First World War, like 1919. But uh, it's, I mean, it's it's basically like an outline of, it's a utopia book to, to a certain degree. Um, but the utopia that he puts forward is like, it's basically fascism. And I don't mean that in a, uh, you know, the the punitive or pejorative sense where it's just, you know, fascism means bad government, like actual fascism. It's pretty close to it. And uh, it's a fascinating read because it was very popular back in its day. And a guy like Colonel House obviously was uh, highly, highly influential, not just in the uh, Wilson administration. And, you know, people people were thinking like he was thinking, you know, among the American elite back then. It's a great book. Interesting. Yeah, well, I'll have to check that out then. Uh, falling outside the normal constraints for two dollars, waiting for this crossover for a long time. Cheers. Thank you very much, sir. We appreciate that. Group of weirdo again here for two dollars. Daryl, stop describing me. <laughs> Thank you again, man. I hope he's not talking about the Epstein part. Oh, well, yeah, I, th I think that was from a much earlier comment. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, but be careful when you when you just float those out there. You never know when they'll actually get read. Uh, so yeah, uh, still here for five dollars. Uh, what is your take on the idea that the military is becoming more and more a jobs program for the Democrats? And the left client <clears throat> classes. Is that true? What do you think? Is the is the left just transforming it into another jobs program for their coalition? Yeah, maybe they're maybe they have that in mind, you know, in the future to some degree. I mean, look, the it's it's again, it's another cliche to say, but it's a demonstrable fact. And and one that you can maybe even kind of understand in a certain from a certain perspective, that uh, you know, government jobs have have been uh you know, they, they tend to be given to groups that are disadvantaged in one way or another that we're trying to lift up or something. It's not a it's not, you know, um, when you go to the DMV or go through a TSA line, it's not a bunch of black women just because they happen to love those careers. Like, you know, it is a jobs program to, to a degree. And one that I think, in, like in those examples, is somewhat defensible. You know, if you're trying to uh, create a middle class among, you know, something like African-Americans, then, you know, the the state, local and federal bureaucracies are a way to do that. Um, and so they have thought that way for a long time. Um, the military. Yeah, I mean, you know what I think more, though, like with all the push to bring in, you know, transsexuals and uh, all just all the, the the constituent parts of the Democratic coalition and, and sort of highlight them and bring them into prominent roles and, and positions in the military. I think what's going on there is um, less a jobs program and more, um, you know, these people are, you know, if you bring a, if you have a, a transsexual assigned to your military unit, whether it's a ship or whatever, then that person is not 
uh, a lieutenant. That person is not, you know, a petty officer, whatever. That is a commissar. That is what that person is there to do. Right. That is a person who, that is a political commissar, just like the Soviet Union. They had a communist party apparatchik attached to every military unit that they had at the highest levels, all the way down to the smallest ones. And their job was to maintain the ideological integrity of those units. And you don't need a whole lot of people to do that, you, you know, and, um, and that's what I think those people are for. Uh, I mean, it, and it hopefully, you know, I mean, it, it, it's very, it's a very effective system once it's yeah. in place. No, I don't think you're wrong about that. All right, David Setchell here for $10. Both your takes on Kubono from uh, situations like these, uh, 20 years in Afghanistan. I think you already touched on this some, but yeah, who benefits from 20 years in Afghanistan? The military uh, officers who are trying to make a name for themselves, politicians, defense contractors. But what is losing a war for 20 years gain anybody? Oh, no. I mean, they didn't intend on losing the war, you know? Sure, sure. Um, the, uh, I mean, look, you can look back in retrospect now. And I think make a very good case that it was just from the beginning, a, a huge mistake to go into Afghanistan. There's, I think, fairly solid evidence that, you know, we probably could have gotten uh, bin Laden at Tora Bora, but we let him escape because if we kill bin Laden, then all right, the war's over. And nobody's going to want to go to Iraq or anywhere else, right? Because we did what we needed to do after 9-11. I think there's a good case for those things. Um, but once you start getting into the meat of the war, you know, five, 10 years in, um, these things tend to have like an institutional momentum of their own, you know, where if you're the from the president all the way on down, if you're the president, you don't want to be the president that this war was officially lost under. Right. right. So you're going to drag it out and let the next guy deal with it. You go down, you're a general in charge of this. You know, you've been assigned to lead all forces in Afghanistan. Well, like, what? of course, what are you going to ask for? Of course, you're going to ask for more resources to do the job and, you know, and, and an expanded mission because that's what you're there to do. I mean, you know, you're not there to, to, to challenge the purpose of the war or anything. And so it goes all the way down where, you know, you, you have institutions and all the individuals in that institutions following, you know, very just mundane incentives, basically, that uh, all together add up to, you know, a larger policy that that ends up being disastrous. But you also have to think about, too, like, qui bono is one way to put it, but I don't know the Latin for who is harmed by something, que mal, maybe, something like that. Uh, but anyway, uh, you know, the fact is that none of these people were harmed by any of this. You know, there's not a single person that you know, had had anybody probably in their families, anybody that they knew probably in their social circle who was killed or had their legs blown off in one of these wars. It does not affect them at all. And, you know, the people talk a lot about how to how to impose a, a certain amount of skin in the game on political leaders. It's really hard to do in our system. And I, I really don't know how you do how you do it. But um, it. it the fact that it doesn't exist certainly leads to some bad outcomes. Absolutely. All right. Let's lightning round these last few here. Death for $5. We're in the same mindset of pre-U.S. entering the war in 1941 and directly firing on German and Japanese boats. Lend lease uh, to Stalin, China, UK. Yep. I think we can all agree that we're we're kind of testing those waters, pretending like nothing bad's going to happen, but but uh, getting far, far too close here. Uh, MG for 199 or when you got Daryl on now, uh, can you get Jocko on? Well, at least now I know a guy. So yeah, no, who, I can make who, that happen. We, can, we can get, we can get uh, Jocko here. Sounds great. All right. Uh, Bogo here for 999. Thank you very much. Why are the GOP senators from the South unable to understand the Ukrainian situation? I, I would say that a lot of that is again, just due to kind of the, uh, the momentum of we've got to support these things. It's all about national security. Obviously, there's a lot of self-interest built into these things, too. These guys want to sit on boards and stuff when they're done. Uh, but uh, but I think that's probably uh, the main reason for that. Yeah, it's also, you, have, you know, these people, when you're talking about a senator, especially, I mean, this dude is, or dude or lady, I guess, but um, that, this person's part of the system, if you're a senator. Right. I mean, you're a part of the program. The ex, you know, the only exceptions you ever really get, you know, are... And this is a limited exception, but, you know, somebody like J.D. Vance, 
who had a public profile of his own, a certain amount of like populist profile. And, and obviously his book was famous so that, you know, he could he could push that through on his own, similar to how Trump didn't really need the support of the party infrastructure. But most senators, you get into that position after a long, long, long vetting process, you know. And um, so I think the people who make it to that level think this way on Ukraine. That's just how it shakes out. Right. Uh, Life of Brian here for $5. The narcissism of our elites is akin to watching a pro basketball player against YMCA standouts. Our institutions cultivate and select for narcissists. Uh, again, yeah, I think I think that's exactly right. Uh, Seth Cook here for $5. Daryl, I recall you having a controversial opinion reading on the book of Job. Why do you not subscribe to the typical reading application? Um, I'll tell you what, that, this is not the time or place for that. It would take <laughs> yeah, that's a, a deeper one. So, yeah. um, I will, I'll tell you what, I'll write an essay on my sub stack and I'll make it available to everybody and I'll try to get that done in the next week or two. Excellent. That sounds fascinating. I'm looking forward to reading that one. And then, uh, Reverend James F cube for nine 99. Thank you. Daryl, are you tracking the Nash, the Christian nationalism debates on Twitter and elsewhere? If so, Thoughts again. That's a that's a large question, but uh, yeah, just just maybe your your quick thought on uh, Christian nationalism. Is, is it going to solve everything? Is it going to pull everybody together? Um, it's a nice thought, uh, but I don't think so, man. Like, but you know, don't listen to me on on things like this. For one reason, is that my, my honest, if I'm being perfectly honest with you, like I fully believe people should be very deeply engaged in their local communities, local politics, and state politics. And you should vote in federal elections to try to stave off the damage that the federal government can do to you. Um, but I don't think that the federal system is salvageable. I, I, I don't think that the, the, the United States as a coast to coast political unit is something that you can't, we just, you're not gonna go backwards, you know? These things, this is liberalism, and leftism in general is, uh, you know, it's 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 not a program. It's a process like rust or corrosion. And we have, you know, we've we've gone so far down that path that, you know, the I was arguing with people about this the other day on, on Twitter. All the frogs were coming after me because it's like kind of my national pastime to piss them off and get into a big fight with them. But the uh you know, the, the, the idea that the that the federal government is going to be reformed, we were talking about immigration and they were talking about, well, you know, we can deport all the illegal immigrants and retroactively get rid of birthright citizenship for all the people who, can, you know, were. And I'm like, come on, man, give me a break. Like the people, people who hate you and hate everything you stand for control every single institution. They're they've shown they are fully willing to use those institutions against anybody who challenges them. And people will say, well, yeah, but the left took over institutions. Why can't we take them back? Because the left knows you're coming. That's why, you know, the, the wasps, the wasp power structure who were, you know, these liberal wasps who were in control of the power structure, the Nelson Rockefeller types back in the mid 20th century, they had no idea what they were facing. And, and, and by the time anybody had any idea of what was going on, it was too late. It was already done. The left, they know you're coming and they're, they're not going to do that. I mean, if you, you know, they'll, they'll steal elections if they have to. And when you protest it, they will execute you on camera and give the murderer a medal, you know? Um, and so, you know, that, people think that's a black pill. To me, it's not a black pill because it's not what time it is, right? It's yeah, the fact that the federal system is lost is not uh, is not the end of the story. There's still a ton to fight for and a ton to do. It's just going to be on a smaller level, you know, on a more local level, whether the feds like it or not, um, states, county sheriffs, towns, municipalities, especially if they work together, you know, a group of states or have a ton of, of power. And this is not 1861. The feds are not going to raise the militia and send them down to invade Idaho because you're, you know, calling yourself a second amendment sanctuary state or something like that. It's not going to happen. And, um, you know, that's where I think all of our focus should be. Of course, you know, the part of the problem is we're a, a, a nation of transients at this point. You know, we probably always have been to some degree. We were a bunch of outcasts from Europe and the rest of the world who showed up on the East coast, 
the people who still couldn't fit in in their new communities on the East Coast moved to the Midwest. The ones who still couldn't fit in kept moving to the West until they crashed into the Pacific Ocean. And that's the mentality we still have today, right? It's a frontier mentality. I don't like it here. I'm not going to plant my flag and stand and fight. I'm going to move to Texas, right? That's what everybody that I know in California is doing. And that's what I'm going to probably end up doing. Um, is that good or bad? I mean, it just, you know, it's a coordination problem, <laughs> you know, is what it is. And uh, coordination problems are much easier to solve on a smaller scale. So, yeah, no, I think there's there's a lot to unpack there, but I think in general, the, the emphasis on understanding that uh, the local is what's going to be important and not sitting around hoping that one uh, that one election saves uh, the entire national system is certainly the right way to look at everything. All right, guys, well, we got to go ahead and go, but thank you so much for coming on, Daryl. Guys, if it's your first time on this uh, channel, make sure that you go ahead and subscribe to the YouTube channel. And if you'd like to get these broadcasts as podcasts, make sure that you go ahead and subscribe to the Orrin McIntyre Show on your favorite podcast network all right guys we're gonna go ahead and go but again thank you so much for coming on daryl and as always everybody i'll talk to you next time